So sorry for not being here with you today. Uh, it's uh, the, the crisis that actually prevents us from uh, going to so many meetings in these days. So sorry for that. And I hope that you are still interested. It's rather late in the evening, but so I will try to make it a little bit shorter than, uh, than, uh, than one hour. So to save your time and also save time for discussions. Now, the, um, the subject of my talk here is um, ultra fast um, electron microscopy. Um, well, electron microscopy is something that you might know. Um, ultra fast may be something that you know less. And um, I'm talking here, as it's already has been mentioned, about a project that we are working on in Strasbourg at the university at the IPCMS on, on this machine that we have set up in the last years. And this is something very special. And I hope you will be um, able after my talk to appreciate that and to see that this is something that can produce uh, new results in research and also that shows how we can combine photonics with uh, electron optics. Okay, so um, electron microscopy and dynamics. So what is that? Um, well, you know, a, a microscope is something that we use for uh, imaging small objects, looking at very small things that we cannot see with the eye. So we need high resolution, a high spatial resolution of this machine to really see the small details. We can also um, do spectroscopy in a microscope or in a light microscope or in an electron microscope just to see how the, um, the rays that we use for imaging interact with the sample. And this produces a spectrum here. So we also would like to have a high resolution uh, in the energy and energy here. And finally in time, so temporal resolution is something very important. And this is new because in microscopy until now, we are mainly looking at rather static images, so at objects that are not moving, at least not moving very fast. But small objects move fast, and this is why uh, the time resolution is something that is, um, is very important. Okay, so now, um, trying to move this. Okay, now high spatial resolution. What is spatial resolution? Uh, if we are looking at the resolving power of microscopes, uh, we will see that with a naked eye, without any magnifying glasses, we can see about, uh, resolve about 100 microns. So this is the smallest size of an object that we can see with the eye. Uh, but of course, there is much more. At the bottom, there is plenty of space at the bottom, as Feynman said. And there we use light microscopes that can go down to about 100 nanometers here. And yeah, with that, we can already see a lot of things like in bare biology, but also in materials. And um, but the, the light microscope ends approximately at the wavelength of the light. You cannot image something that is much smaller than the wavelength of the of the of the rays that you're using. And to get even better resolution, uh, electron microscopes have been invented, uh, and uh, where the electron has a much smaller wavelength than the light, which is, as you may know, by the de Broglie relation, possible if you go to uh, short wavelengths to high electron energies. Then we have a, a very short wavelength. Yeah, and then you can see viruses, something is very important in these days, of course, and even smaller objects down to the size of, of atoms. And we can go down to about less than five, about five times 10 to the minus 11 meters, so 50 picometers. This is the limit that we achieve in electron microscopy today, but of course in dedicated uh, high resolution electron micros microscopes. Now, um, time resolution is something which is equally important and that you may know that from photonics. Um, if you want to see fast things in, in matter, and we, um, then of course we need an instrument that allows us uh, to record pictures at very short exposure times. And this is shown here, uh, synchrotron, for example, or free electron lasers, and we use ultra fast X-ray pulses. Um, which is rather standard today, but the machines are huge. And uh, this is something which is maybe now a little bit better, also fast laser spectroscopy. This is a tabletop experiment, but also something that needs, um, yeah, that, that uh, allows you to get uh, resolution. These both are down to the femto or even sub femto second scale. But these two lack uh, of, um, of really high spatial resolution. This is why Electron microscopy, uh, ultra-fast electron microscopy has been invented to improve uh, the spatial resolution at 
high temporal resolution, not just as high as here. So it's very hard to go down to the femtor or other second scale. There are some developments, but this is very, uh, it's very, very specialized things. But um, the, uh, anyway, we can get very much, um, a much better spatial resolution than these other techniques. Now, uh, first, you might ask, why do we need, why do we really need ultra fast microscopies? Do we really need something? Is, is there really something so fast yeah, at the nanospace, um, at the nanoscale that we need um, an, an, an ultra fast microscope? Well, if you, you, you might have noticed that if, um, if you take photographs of objects and an object is moving, you know, a really big object is moving slowly like this elephant. So where the photographer uh, has to do just uh, with a shutter speed of one tenth of a second, he can already get sharp images of an elephant, even if the elephant is moving. Now, if you're going to smaller uh, species like uh, flies and mosquitoes, yeah, they are moving much, much at much higher speed and much faster. And then the photographer actually, uh, he will notice that the shutter cannot follow anymore. It's not fast enough to get a sharp image. And so what he does is he opens the shutter and then fires the flash you know, flashlight here, and a flashlight has only a, a time of, uh, actually it's only about uh, a few microseconds, so um, this is much, much faster than the shutter can do. Just opens up the shutter, then fire the flash, and then you can close the shutter and you will get a sharp image. Now, as we go to the atomic scale, things are even getting much, much smaller and much, much faster. We need a magnifying glass or something that magnifies the object, of course, and then we also need, because the atoms are vibrating, they are doing things um, so that we are, uh, we need much, much shorter exposure times. Yeah, and then we use an electron microscope and a flash of electrons, not a flight here, a flash of electrons, which is, is even shorter and we can go down to about a picosecond um, with, the, um, uh, with, the, with the time of the, actually with the, the length of the electron pulse, the length in space and in, in time at the same time. Now, um, let me first quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with electron microscopy, uh, talk a few words about electron microscopy. I want to do the, make this very short and very um, brief so that, um, that uh, we are not losing, uh, we are getting lost in the details. So what is an electron microscope? This is such a typical column, the height of two or three meters. Um, and here the electrons are first accelerated in an electron gun, then they are focused by lenses onto an object, the specimen is here. This is now transmission electron microscopy. So the electron beam goes through the object. We are looking into the interior of the object. And then we have some lenses, uh, again, these are magnetic lenses to magnify the image and to project it onto a screen here or onto a camera. And we can also lift up the screen and then expose a spectrometer and measure the energy of the electron. So you see this here, this is the viewing chamber. The specimen is right here. And here's a spectrometer for this called electron energy loss spectrometer for um, detecting the energy loss of um, which results from the inelastic interaction of the uh, beam uh, with the object. Now, a few words about the elements of such, a, of such an electron microscope. We are mainly using an, a thermal electron gun, which is an emitter. It is normally a tip which is heated. And then the electrons are coming out just thermally. And uh, we use this cap here, it's called a Vaynert cap. It's an electrostatic lens, which is even more negative than the, the filament and focuses the electron beam through a hole towards the anode. So it is typically 200 kV between the cathode and the anode. So the electrons have very high energy. Uh, there's also the possibility of using field emission. Field emission, uh, the tip can be cold, can be heated or it can be cold. And then the electrons are extracted by an extremely high electric field and then accelerated here uh, and even focused. This is an electrostatic lens that fo already focuses the electrons. The same here. So first it's electrostatics and then the other lenses are electromagnetic. And this is how the lenses in, a, in an electron microscope look like. Of course, you cannot use a glass lens or as in, in light microscopy, the electrons are not going through. But um, we are using here magnetic fields and these, uh, these are coils around pole pieces and the, the magnetic field is inhomogeneous because the homogeneous field would not uh, focus a parallel electron rays. So the, um, the rays are, are focused here in this inhomogeneous field and this is just the ray path that, that we typically have. It's exactly the same as in optics, in light optics that you might know a little bit better. And we have also have the same trouble. We have aberrations, spherical, 
romantic and some other like astigmatism, coma, and so on. So we have lots of different lens uh, problems, lens aberrations, and we have to correct them. So this is generally a problem in electron microscopy. Now, um, there are two ways of using this electron microscope, and one is in real space and one is in reciprocal space. So you should not get confused by this complicated ray pass diagram. Um, this is just the lower part, the bottom part of the electron microscope. So we have the object here. This is this little arrow here. And now the object has to be imaged. And this, these are the lenses. This is actually the objective lens. So what the lens does is it focuses parallel rays into the focal plane. It's something you know. And then uh, a bit uh, further down, we have the first, uh, the, the image plane. So it's a focal plane and then the image plane. So here's the, the focal, uh, the diffraction pattern, and here's the image. And then we can magnify everything. And in imaging, actually, we use this plane here, this plane that we, you know, we focus the next lens onto this plane so that this plane is finally imaged on the screen. And this is the imaging mode. On the other hand, we can also use this lens here um, to focus onto that plane here. And this is the, the plane where you see where the deflected beams cross here. And this is the diffraction. So it's a focal plane. And if we are imaging the focal plane, we are getting a diffraction pattern. Okay, and this is just push button. Um, we can switch between these two modes. It's like a zoom lens. Uh, we just, um, you know, we just change the current in, in the lenses. This is very simple. Okay, so here we're looking at real space and here reciprocal space. Now, electron waves, how do they interact with the, um, with the specimen? We start here, we are looking just as an atom. This is scatterer. And the incident beam comes in from here. This is a plane wave yeah, with a wave vector K. And the atom is here, and the atom scatters. And this is actually Huygens and Fresnel's principle. The atom creates a spherical wave um, due to the scattering. And the spherical wave after that propagates and interferes with the, the planar wave, that is for the incoming wave. Oh, and so it's going into a certain um, angle, as, um, um, a solid angle omega. Now, if we have many atoms, which is normally the case in a specimen, in a crystalline specimen, here you see we have all the atoms here. And the same thing happens on every atom. So we are creating these spherical wavelets. And these wavelets interfere with each other. And they're in a certain direction. You might get constructive interference. So these are the solid lines here, zero order, first order, and second order. So this is constructive in this direction. In some other directions, it might be destructive. And this is the principle of diffraction. So it means in this direction, we are really getting intensity. And in some other directions between them, there is no intensity. OK, and now it's a complicated interference pattern that we are finally imaging. Now, uh, the, now we know what we, what we have in the microscope and what we, what we have in the specimen. But of course, we, we need to see the object. So we have to produce um, contrast. Now, contrast is, um, well, this is just a simple ray path um, imaging with an objective lens. So these are the parallel rays, and these rays here to the left and to the right are the rays that are diffracted in a certain direction. And here, these you see the diffraction spots here where the, um, the, these rays uh, cross each other. Now, um, let's assume we have a specimen which is, has a lower mass on the left hand and a higher mass on the right hand side. So let's say aluminum here and gold on the other side. And then there is, of, of course, more scattering on the gold side because the atoms are heavier. The cross-section for scattering is higher. And it means that the scattering angle on the average is higher here. There are more scattered electrons on this side. Now, if we use a small aperture here, just uh, in the focal plane, it's called objective aperture, and we are blocking all these scattered rays, then we are getting, it's called bright field, we're getting mass or thickness contrast. So there is darkness here, yeah, because there is, or everything is scattered, and there is brightness on the other side because there is not much scattering there. Um, we can also get um, contrast, just uh, we can now play with the, with the aperture, creating bright or dark field contrast. This is bright field. Uh, it's the same as in optical microscopy. We are using a small aperture on the optical axis. So it means that the scattered rays are blocked and the, the unscattered rays are going through. This is an, an example of an image just from the literature. So there is brightness where there is no object because there is no scattering. Now, if we shift the aperture a little bit and we go onto one of these diffracted rays, but the undiffracted ray is blocked, 
Then of course there is darkness when there is no object and then there is brightness when we get scattering in a certain direction. So this is like a negative, a negative of the other. This is dark field, right? And dark field imaging is exactly the same as in optical microscopy. Now lattice imaging, we want to get images of, um, of crystal lattices. Um, there we use multi-beam imaging because we need all the information from the diffracted beams where these rays cross each other. And then we use a, a large aperture here, with, so we need to get all the information through that. It's also obvious principle, so the larger the angle here, the higher is the resolution of the optical system. Yeah, and here we are on the diffraction plane, and then it allows us getting these images like this. This is an image of a graphene sheet, and you see the hexagons here, so you can actually see every every atom in, in such a, it's a monoatomic plane, you can get every, you see every atom in, in the plane. But it is a complicated interference pattern of the electrons that are scattered on all these different atoms. So it's not so trivial. Yeah, mathematically, this is a, a, a Fourier transformation, so Fourier uh, between a real and reciprocal space in diffraction and then inverse Fourier transformation if we go back to the image here. Okay, so these were a few words. Uh, yeah, very quickly, break diffraction. I think you know that, you have learned that. Uh, break diffraction is just coherent interaction of um, of the rays that are scattered at different crystal planes. Here, this might be constructive here if the two scattered waves are in phase or destructive if they are not in phase, also in, in anti-phase here. And this is the break condition, so it is related to the spacing between the planes and or it relates the spacing between the planes uh, with the angle, the diffraction angle. Yeah, if we are um, looking at crystals, then we are looking at sets of lattice planes and uh, at a certain, you know, an arbitrary direction, we are uh, seeing um, just spots here where we are, um, where we satisfy the, the diffraction condition. And uh, if we are in a zone axis, so if we are normal to several axis, actually the electron beam is normally parallel to the uh, to, to the plane that if the break angles are very small, then we are getting something like that. This is a zone axis pattern. Yeah, how does it, uh, I already talked about spectroscopy. Um, so how does it work? Electron energy loss spectroscopy. This is the electron microscope here. So the electron beam goes through the sample. And then there are lots of um, interactions happening in the sample. The electron beam is scattered, creates secondary backscattered electrons or X-rays, OJ electrons, and so on. And um, but if, if if we get inelastic scattering, so the scattering between the electron from the beam with the electrons of the specimen, this is inelastic because both have the same mass. And the scattering is in forward direction. But then we can measure the energy that the electron has lost. And this is done here with such an energy loss spectrometer. This is a magnetic field, a magnetic prism, where the different energies are separated here. Yeah, and then we are getting a spectrum, a yield spectrum. I will come back to that in the context of uh, ultrafast microscopy in a minute, where you can see which elements are in your specimen. <coughs> and you can even determine the ratio between the different peaks and do a quantitative analysis of your specimen. And this at a nanoscale, so at a almost nanometer scale. So this is a chemical analysis of the specimen just by um, an electron beam. Okay, now we are getting closer to ultrafast microscopy. Um, now we want to do see something dynamic. So the object is moving. Normally the object does not always move, so you have to do something to make the object move, and there are different possibilities. So what can we do here? We have now the object. We want to, this is called in C2 electron microscopy. So we want to see what happens. We can irradiate the, the object with electrons in an electron beam and look what happens under the beam. This is something I've, <clears throat> I've worked on, on that very long time. You can change the temperature. There is, um, um, we have a heating stage in the microscope and we can heat up the object. We can establish an electrical contact with, this, with an STM tip, for example, in the specimen chamber. Or you can put the um, the, uh, the object into an environment. So this is into gas or into a liquid. So all that is, is possible, and there are even other techniques. This is called in situ. So we are doing some, we are doing an experiment in the electron microscope. But here in conventional electron microscopy, the, the electron beam is continuous, and it is very weak. 
So the problem is noise, signal noise ratio on the camera, because if we expose for only, let's say, some nanoseconds, there's almost nothing because the electron beam is too weak. So what do we have to do to improve the, 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 the temporal resolution, which is at best about one millisecond with the best cameras, the best electron detection cameras that we have today. Um, yeah, we have what we actually are doing. We have to do such an experiment. It is a pump probe experiment. We have to irradiate. We have to work with um, um, with um, short electron pulses and to irradiate this first to irradiate the specimen with a photon pulse. Yeah, we have lasers, ultra fast lasers. So this is um, a pump probe experiment, and this is then ultra fast electron microscopy. Now this is now we start the actual subject ultra fast TEM. This is the microscope that we have set up in Strasbourg in the last year. So with the was an Equipex um, uh, project has been funded here. So this is the column of the standard 200 keV microscope, and here you see these optical tables with a lot of optics and lasers on them. Uh, so it was um, you know a lot of work to set up that. It took us very long, and also to do my git running and to. Um, find out all the parameters of the working of, of this microscope so but now it is working and we are producing results so this is now let's now let's see how this system works the basis is a pump probe experiment now pump probe maybe you know what this is this you know it from optical spectroscopy or from x-rays this is if you want to um you want to study the dynamics fast dynamics of your object so first you use um um, a pump pulse. <coughs> so this is typically a laser pulse. You can make, make laser pulse almost as short as you want. You can go down to the sub femtosecond scale, but you can also use nanosecond laser. So everything is possible. Then you're exciting your specimen with a with a pulse. So it's either direct optical excitation or it is thermal excitation. Both happens in the specimen or one or the other. What you ever want to do. So this triggers the transformation of the object. Now the second is the probe. The probe is, you know, the you want to see what happens now, and this is actually this. These are the rays that allow you to see what happens in the object. So this this probe is also a short pulse, and it goes through the object. In our case, these are electron pulses, and these electron pulses follow the pump pulses, and they create even the image or diffraction pattern or a spectrum. Now the delay between these two is something you should be able to control. And by varying the delay, you can uh, follow the temporal evolution of the specimen after the pump pulse. So you are varying delta t, and then you are getting time result information about the transformation that you trigger with this with the pump pulse here. Yes. So how can we create photoelectron pulses? We know how we can create uh, ultra fast laser pulses. I'm not talking about that, uh, but if you have ever worked with lasers, you will know how this works, uh, different techniques of making short laser pulses. Uh, so let's assume we already have the short laser pulses, then we are sending these photon pulses onto a metal. And then the photoelectric effect actually is responsible that the electrons are coming out. This is what Einstein got the Nobel Prize for. So this he explained the photoelectric effect. This is funny, but not for relativity. So this was Einstein's uh, merit to, uh, to describe how this how this works and what he was rewarded for. Okay, so now the photon is coming in, has high energy, excites the electron in the middle, and the electrons can be knocked off. And now the energy is H nu minus. So it's, it's a difference between the photon energy and the work function. The work function is the energy you need to extract the electrons. Now you have the electrons with a well-defined energy. And in, in the case of an electron microscope, it works like that. So you have the cathode here, this is a little metal disc or metal tip, and you're sending a laser pulse onto that. And this is the, the geometry, this is this vein of capsule, so it's the electrode that finally focuses the electron beam. This is the anode, and then the electron beam is actually coming out of the electron pulse like in a standard microscope <coughs> and creates crossovers here in the focal point of, um, of these lenses here. But the problem is, of course, there is space charge on the cathode, so we have many electrons here that repel each other. And this is also a problem in the crossovers here, so in the focal points, because now we are working with many electrons at the same time. 
and in, in if you're looking at the standard standard electron microscope you always have typically you have one electron at a time in the column because the electron beam is weak and so one electron follows uh, the other with a long distance but here you have a bunch of electrons and they repel each other this is a problem in in in, in photons don't do that photons are bosons you can squeeze photons in a small volume as you wish but not electrons the electrons they repel each other so i will come back to this problem in a moment um, if we are now looking at the realization of this problem, this is the column of the microscope. So first we send a laser pulse to the, the specimen and uh, then a second laser pulse onto the, onto the photocathode after a delay delta T. And then the electron bunch is coming down here. So the electron bunch has a size uh, typically a time of, um, actually we can go down to the nanoseconds, from nanosecond to picoseconds. So this is, um, what we are typically getting. Okay, so this is a pump probe experiment, and here we need ultraviolet pulses to uh, be sure that uh, that we are overcoming the the work function of the, the metal surface here. This is a setup you just see. Um, this is an image of the microscope. This is from the left hand side. There is a femtosecond laser here. And we have two outputs, a UV and uh, an IR output of the laser going through the tubes here behind the microscope and then on the other side of the microscope it's complicated optics i'm not going to the details so the two beams are one is focused is typically an infrared beam onto the specimen through windows and mirrors in the column and the other one is going onto the photocathode and to uh to adjust the delay between pump and power and probe we can use if we have very short delays we can just use an optical movable mirror and just the um, you know the travel time of the of the light here um, uh, finally determines the delta t. Or we can take two lasers, like two nanosecond lasers, and couple them electronically. We are doing both here in this microscope. Now there are two fundamental operation modes of such an electron microscope, and one is called stroboscopic, and the other single shot. <clears throat> now let's assume uh, we are exciting the object with a laser pulse. And then after excitation, the object is going back to its initial state. So this it lets you, you just excite the object and it's going, it's falling back to its to its, its initial state. This is a reversible transition. And it, the advantage here is that we can do it many times and uh, just one pulse after the other, leave the shutter open and just always do pump probe, pump probe, and so on until we have enough intensity on the camera. The advantage is that we can make the electron pulses extremely weak. Only one electron per pulse is possible. And then we do not have this repulsion problem in the pulse, which is very important. Okay, but it's really restricted because it's only working for reversible transitions. For irreversible transitions, so if the object does not um, re, um, actually reestablish its, its, its state after excitation, we need a single shot. Only one, but very intense pulse. So we are sending an intense pulse to the specimen, a second intense pulse for imaging, and then it's gone. It's irreversible, so we can only do it once. And this is, of course, difficult because we need enough intensity on the camera in just one single shot. And so we have to squeeze many electrons into one pulse, and this is, this is the difficulty. Um, so this means that single shot is much more difficult than stroboscopic and all the very few laboratories in the world uh, that are doing that. Now this is a quick, um, this is just a quick setup how um, how this looks like. Um, this um, in in the column. So this is for the stroboscopic. I'm not going into detail here. We use a femtosecond laser. We can split it here uh, into um, into the the pump uh, pulse and and the probe pulse. We use this is nonlinear frequency multiplication. So we're getting UV. Yeah, and then we are sending both. Uh, uh, one to the object and the other one onto the cathode, and then we are getting picoseconds. So we can walk in the pico to nanosecond range. The optical delay is just this movable mirror. <coughs> and here we have typically less than 1,000 electrons per pulse. This is already a lot. So we are working with 100 or even less electrons per pulse. And the pulse is very, very short in space. So a 370 femtosecond, this is our femtosecond laser. It's only 0.15 millimeters long so it's a very short pulse but it is weak now for the single shot we use two lasers mainly two nanosecond lasers that we are coupling with a 
electronic delay. Yeah, one is sent to the specimen and the other one to the gun that produces the, um, the electron pulse. We use this for irreversible processes <coughs> and then we can go from the nano to the millisecond. But the, our electron pulses have to be very intense to get enough intensity on the camera or the spectrometer to produce an image. So this is the difficulty here. And we have developed, it took us a long time to develop that because there's almost no recipe. This is, um, uh, lots of things are new. This was the second microscope in the world that was dedicated to that. The first is in Lawrence Livermore. And we were very lucky to have one of the great experts, uh, Thomas Lagrange, who helped us to, to set up this, uh, the single shot mode. Okay, here now with seven, seven nanosecond uh, lasers, we are getting a pulse length of three meters. And this already reduces the repulsion problem. So the electrons are distributed along a spike of three meters length, and this is, uh, this is much easier to do that. Okay, now uh, this is a nice image that I found from the work of Hensky van der Wey. This was in Seweil's group in Ahmed Seweil in, in Caltech. Um, this is ultra fast electron energy loss spectroscopy. It's the same principle: pump probe, excitation, and then after a certain, this is the uh, this is the excitation is followed by the converged electron pulse after delta T, and then it's going through the spectrometer, and you can take spectra of your specimen in uh, different time intervals to uh, <coughs> to um, uh, to find out, for example, the chemical composition as a function of time, which might uh, change very rapidly. And we have done that, and I'm going to show this later. Now, uh, once again, the problem, the difficulties um, with respect to normal electron microscopy is mainly the, the space charge. So the many electrons that leave the photocathode and repel each other, and the Birch effect is the same phenomenon, but it's in the focal point. So in the crossovers in the ray path, uh, you're squeezing the electrons to small spots and then they repel each other. So everything leads to a broadening in space, time, and energy. So the faster electrons are here ahead and the slower are uh, behind the, the, the other ones. It is um, coherence is reduced because this broadens. And of course, there's also delta T between this, um, the first and the last electron of, of a bunch. So the problem is coherence, reduced coherence, aberrations, because we have a delta E, an energy spread, which finally creates aberrations because the electron length, the focal point, the focal length depends on the energy. And um, last not least, signal noise ratio, which is also uh, um, actually the limiting uh, point in, in single shot microscopy. In stroboscopic, we can circumvent many of these problems just by using very, very few electrons per pulse. Now, what are the demands on ultra-fast uh, TEM? We want to study dynamic processes from the milli to the femtosecond, in imaging, uh, diffraction, and uh, spectroscopy, <coughs> all at high spatial resolution. Otherwise, we wouldn't need a microscope. Reversible as well as irreversible transitions, so in stroboscopic and single shot. Many weak pulses here, only one intense pulse. Few electrons here, many electrons per pulse. And now we could integrate both of these modes in, in, the, in our project into one electron microscope, so it works in both modes. Okay, now just a few uh, data what our microscope can do. This is now with photoelectrons in the stroboscopic mode, so with weak electron pulses. We could even get lattice resolution. So this is um, a gold particle. We see the lattice planes. This image with photoelectrons. <coughs> excuse me. So photoelectrons. So it means um, we have done this with very short, with picosecond electron pulses, but two megahertz. So um, about ten seconds exposure time. So it was twenty million exposures that we acquired here. But there was no laser on the specimen, and this is the difficulty. Here, because as soon as you excite the specimen with a laser pulse, you're getting uh, the specimen makes a jump, and then the specimen is shivering, and this reduces the resolution. So it's finally the specimen interaction that uh, the, the 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 photon specimen interaction that limits resolution. In electron energy loss spectroscopy, we could get a peak of 0.8 eV. It's a very good energy resolution. In the spectroscopic mode, it's even better than in the thermal mode. We can operate this microscope in the, in the normal thermal mode, so it's possible. Now, this is something I don't go into detail here. <coughs> it just shows the uh, stroboscopic uh, mode, the different resolutions that we get: time resolution, energy resolution as a function of the beam current, 
and so on. So we always have to find trade-offs between these different resolutions and beam intensity if we want to work with this microscope. So I'm not talking about this more. In single shot, <coughs> in single shot image resolution, it's much worse. It depends on the, the bias of the electrode. This is also some technical detail that I'm not uh, explaining here. Um, but you see already see there's a lot of noise in the image. The resolution is not excellent, but nevertheless, there is um, it is possible to do imaging with single um, electron pulses of seven nanoseconds. Now this was energy loss uh, spectroscopy. We can get very narrow energy loss peaks or very narrow energy widths of the beam. Uh, if we um, here we have integrated over many pulses, so this is not really what we want. With one single pulse, it's getting very broad. So we have a much less energy resolution here. And this finally allowed us to, to acquire, or actually to take the first electron energy loss spectrum of the world with one single electron pulse. So it is um, a <coughs> very fast chemical analysis that we can do. This was with, was with one seven nanosecond pulse, nickel oxide on carbon film. So this carbon, oxygen, nickel peaks. Yeah, this is almost raw data. Of course, it's a terrible resolution for EELS experts, but uh, but you can do this with high, high speed, so with nanosecond resolution. And this allowed us to uh, record the speed of chemical reactions with nanosecond resolution. <coughs> Some specifications of our microscope. This is uh, stroboscopic, and in single shot modes. I'm not talking about all this in detail, so we can go down to about one picosecond, a little bit worse. Um, uh, time resolution, one EV energy resolution, and uh, spatial resolution is very good, but um, under real conditions, this might be clearly worse. In single shot, um, we um, we are we typically typically have an, a resolution of seven nanoseconds, and the energy resolution is much worse. It's typically some tens of EV in spectroscopy. Spatial resolution is also not so good, but. <laughs> and we achieved many experiments on one specimen. Okay, now. So what is this um, this microscope good for? What, what do we want to study? This is now um, a number of different um, uh, transformations or, or processes <laughs> that we study on a spatial and a temporal scale. Now, uh, did you see spatial? This is in meter, this is in seconds. In conventional TEM, we are getting this, uh, approximately this scale here. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is very weak today. I don't know why. <clears throat> so conventional TEM, so one microsecond and uh, ultra fast TEM. So we can see much more. We can go down to the picosecond. Lots of different transformations different structures that we can see, magnetic switches, melting, <coughs> chemical reactions, fast reactions, defects, and so on. I want to show you three examples of our studies that we did in the last um, years or months and years. This is a stroboscopic study about reversible trans uh, decisions in nanomaterials for the switching of spin over nanoparticles. This is uh, something that we have done in collaboration with Guillaume Chastanet in Bordeaux. The second is, an, this is a single shot study, irreversible transitions in nanomaterials about fast chemical reactions at nanoscale. And the third is about amorphization of metal crystals <coughs> under laser pulses. This is uh, not time resolved. Now, let's look at the first material that we are studying here. Our spin crossover materials. What is a spin crossover material? So these are typically uh, metal organic particles. Uh, here's an iron atom, for example. And there are organic ligands around that. And under light irradiation or under thermal pulses, there's a spin transition. So in the iron, <laughs> the spin goes from zero to two, so from dia to paramagnetic. Okay, and that means that the length is changing here of the bonds. <clears throat> and this is reversible. This is the advantage. 
So it means if we irradiate this with light pulses, we see how the molecule is breathing. So the, the, the bond length is changing all the time. And it's always going back. If we have a crystal, <coughs> a crystal of this material, and we are sending photon pulses on it, we see how the whole crystal changes its size. It's reversible. So it's an interesting network switch. It's a photo switch of this material. Okay, and this is something that we can see in the electron microscope. So we are sending laser pulses onto that, and we are seeing how it switches. What we have done here, we have, um, these are the particles actually, it was our collaborator, Georg Chastanet and, and his group in, in Bordeaux, integrated gold particles into these SEO particles. So these are some hundred nanometers across gold particles, <coughs> only very few nanometers, so it's a plasmonic effect. And then what happens? We send a photon pulse onto the gold. And then by plasmonic resonance, the gold starts heating up and dissipates the heat to the particle around it, to the SAO particle, and then it heats up and will expand. Now here we see a length measurement in the um, with an electron pulse, and we see that it expands, so it's getting bigger uh, after some time. This is 20 nanoseconds after this pulse here. So this before, <coughs> and this after 20 nanoseconds. We see that it's getting hot and then it's getting longer. And this is our photo switch. Yeah, we have done the measurements. I think I do not have to go into all detail here. This was now pure. Spin crossover material, now gold. And we see that the switching here, this is the expansion at a function of time. Depending on the laser power that we use, it's it's getting it's getting it's getting longer, and here it saturates. And here we see that um, this is with a better better time resolution that of course if we use a higher pulse intensity, it heats up faster, it, it heats up more, but it's still very inefficient. So what we can do is we can include uh, we can include uh, these gold particles, and we have done the same here. Now with the gold, um, this is no gold particle. The red curve, the, the violet curve, is one gold particle, and the blue one is three gold particles. And here we measure the expansion as a function of time. Now we clearly see that it's heating up within less than twenty nanoseconds, so it's a very fast switch. And it's the more efficient, the more gold particles we have inside. So this is something which is quite uh, quite useful for um, making this more efficient. And um, here we always use the same laser energy. And so it's a very useful technique, ultra fast microscopy to see this uh, <coughs> to see this um, this expansion as a function of time and to measure this uh, the expansion times. Now, the second uh, example that I'm going to show is an irreversible experiment with a single shot. There we looked at a chemical reaction. Here, um, this is the experiment. We have the electron beam here. And now some people told us before we did it, this is not really useful because every shot will destroy the specimen. <coughs> and so the uh, and so yeah, every time you have to exchange the specimen, but it turned out this is not the case. We can focus the beam onto the specimen and then and then we can see how uh, we can do this many times if we have similar specimen areas here. So we can do up to 150 experiments on one grid without exchanging it. The system that we have chosen is nickel oxide nickel oxide nanocrystals <coughs> in, a, in a thin film on a carbon substrate. So this is here, 20 nanometers. It has been done with Natalie Via and, and her group in Strasbourg. And now we are sending a laser pulse onto that. And after one laser pulse, we see that it has completely reduced. So nickel is elementary, there's no more oxide. So it's only nickel on carbon and the oxygen is gone. But this is, of course, this is a study experiment. So here we see the, the initial state. There was a laser shot, and this is the final state. Now these are images as a function of time. We cannot do this. We can vary the pump probe delay. 
<coughs> and now we see that <coughs> this is the nickel oxide and the noise makes it a little bit difficult to resolve the crystals. But here, after 1.5 microseconds, we see these black dots here, so the nickel crystals appear. After three microseconds, the reaction is already completed because it doesn't change anymore. So it's a very fast reaction. This is an imaging. Now you can do the same in, uh, in electron energy loss spectroscopy. So this shows all the, the elements that we have. This is a nickel peak, which does not change. This is the, the, the time, it's a function of time. And the oxygen vanishes. So after three microseconds, it has vanished. There's no more oxygen. And this is in accordance with what, what we see in imaging. So the reaction takes place. It's a, very, it's a reaction at very high temperature within a few microseconds. And then it's over. And to find out what really happens about the, the kinetics, what we are interested in the kinetics of this reaction, <coughs> we can do this in diffraction. This is now finally diffraction. And here we see uh, the diffraction peaks of, um, of nickel oxide. So again, this is the delay that you see here. So here we are starting the experiment. The, the peak on the left-hand side, this is from the, the, carbon, um, the carbon substrate. So this is not of interest here. And this, the 2 to O reflection of nickel uh, disappears after a few microseconds, which is in accordance with imaging and diffraction and, and, and yields. But the peak, the, the 2 to O of nickel, does not appear immediately, and which is not in accordance. It only appears about some tens or 100 microseconds, and it's there. So what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is that there must be a liquid transition state of nickel between here and here, which is quite obvious because everything is very small, it's very hot, and this explains the kinetics. So the nickel first goes to a liquid state, and then the carbon diffuses through the nickel and then allows the, um, the, the reduction reaction. So this is our the conclusion here. So we learned a lot about the kinetics. We learned about the reaction speed. I'm not talking about this in much detail. The reaction speed, and we talked about um, we learned and we learned about the kinetics. So we see what the intermediate uh, phases on in the specimen are really. So that is liquid. It's very important. So the kinetics. We did all the analysis that I'm not showing here in detail, and we find the reaction constant here. And we, um, we also find it's a reaction of first order, although we would expect a reaction of second order because we have the two reactants on the left and two products on the right hand side. But the, actually the mechanism that we now found is that this is the carbon which is diffu diffusing through the, nickel, the liquid nickel droplet and then finally limit, limits the, um, the supply of carbon which is in accordance with a reaction of uh, first order. So this is now very useful to study the chemistry of um, this technique, the chemistry of, uh, of in, at the nanoscale and also at uh, nanos, nanometer and nanosecond scale. Now, um, a few words about the, um, actually, this is another study <coughs> that we used to, um, to look at transformation of metal particles and, the, and, the, and the intense laser pulses. And here we observe an amorphization of iron which is encapsulated in a, in a carbon shell here. This diffraction that we see, <coughs> it's going under an intense laser pulse, it's going to amorphous. And then later we see it's going to, um, to a carbide, so crystalline carbide, and this turns again to amorphous phase. And it switches forth and back between these different phases and the laser pulses. And the explanation is mainly this is an carbon is going into solution, so we are producing an amorphous metal particle. The metal carbon uh, phase, and um, we haven't done the time resolved experiment yet because it's very difficult. Uh, but we hope to do this very soon. We have done the same with cobalt. You can see here cobalt is finally also transformed uh, to amorphous cobalt and uh, and the cobalt carbide, which is something quite unstable under intense laser pulse. You can do all that even if you are not measuring the time. Um, you can do this in uh, in uh, in this electron microscope because we have the lasers that are coupled um, to the column. It does not work for gold, which allows us to uh, conclude that these are mainly metal carbon solutions that are uh, transform and that are uh, producing these amorphous um, materials. Now quenching is very important here. So it cools down rapidly, it heats up extremely fast, it cools down very fast, carbon feedstock and so on. 
Now let me at the end um, quickly show something where we worked, but we did not produce new results yet. <coughs> this is a so-called, uh, well, this is an application in quantum science. And there we are using the light electron interaction to modify actually electron waves in a coherent way. Now, um, quantum electron optics, this is actually a new keyword and some groups are already specialized. There are two groups in Germany and uh, some in the USA and in Israel and in Switzerland are working on it. Um, the basis of the, of the phenomenon, which is real quantum phenomenon is the following. If we have an object here <coughs> and an electron beam just passes next to the object, there is no electron energy loss because it does not interact with the object. However, if you irradiate the object with an intense photon field, so with a laser pulse, then the plasmonic resonance of the specimen creates the evanescent photon field. And when the electron goes through the field, not with the specimen, just through the photon field, it can interact in a coherent way with the photon field and change its energy by plus minus the photon energy. So the electron energy is not the same anymore. After it has interacted in vacuum, I have to say it again, it's in vacuum with the photon field. And you can see this in electron energy loss spectroscopy. This is without photon irradiation, you see just the standard energy of the electron beam. And if you switch on the, the laser, so you irradiate photons, you see these small peaks here, and the spacing between two peaks is, corresponds exactly to the photon energy. And so this is, it can gain or lose energy. So the electron can gain or lose energy, the photon energy. Yeah, we have done uh, lots of experiments on that, plus to, to calibrate the microscope and to find the, the time zero. It was a complicated thing, but I'm not showing this in detail. But this is a very interesting, um, there are interesting studies going on now in other groups. We are not really experts. <coughs> the first was by uh, the group in Göttingen, so uh, in Klaus Ober's group in, in 2015, they showed that this can also, we can get transitions between these different coupled electron photon states, so-called Rabi oscillations, and uh, the side bands here are getting higher than the, the, the fundamental band. This is um, actually, it's a sign of, of quantum coherent phase manipulation of these three electron states, and some people are working on it. So as I said, we have not yet really produced results on that because uh, our interest is more in materials, but I just want to show you the potential here that ultra-fast electron microscopy has and also in, in quantum physics. Now I conclude. Um, so we have set up an ultra-fast electron micros microscope that works in stroboscopic and single shot mode, allows us imaging diffraction yields, everything fast, reversible or irreversible uh, reactions in uh, so stroboscopic and single shot. <coughs> we obtained quantitative, the first quantitative single shot experiments in an electron microscope. There was only one electron microscope before ours that produced single shot results was the one in Livermore in, in the USA. We determined reaction constant in nanomaterials at high temperatures. We are detecting short-lived uh, transition states. <coughs> and it's also clear that this technique, ultra-fast TM, has some um, potential in quantum, in quantum physics, quantum electron optics. Now, at the end, I just to advertise, um, if you are interested and want to do experiments on ultra-fast TM, there is the META net network. And um, I just have um, copied something from the web page of META. This is opening uh, electron microscopes for external users. So it's a network of different microscopy laboratories in France. And external users can send very short proposals. Normally, these proposals are accepted. And then uh, they are paying because there's no free lunch, but, but Meta is paying the lunch. So actually they can do, um, with that you can do the experiment. Um, also in our laboratory, if you have an interesting problem, first you have to contact us and uh, after that uh, write a one or two page proposal. So this is a rather simple procedure, but this also way the chance of getting funded is very high. Now, last slide, I'm uh, acknowledgements. First, I want to acknowledge, of course, different funding agencies who made this possible um, to set up this new uh, electron microscopy technique. Then also the group, our group members, they are not all on the same uh, picture here because they have been here partly at different times. Um, we did the experiments. Um, Kerstin has worked on the microscope and uh, the setup of the microscope. Mathieu is our technical um, and, and engineer de recherche, so our technical expert who is all the, the, doing the hardware. Shiam has done the 
um, the, the chemical analysis in single shot and uh, Yahweh has done the, uh, um, the, the experiment on SEO materials and uh, Jin worked on the um, amorphous uh, metals. I should also mention Thomas Lagrange, who is now at the EPFL. He's a great expert and he has been in ultra fast TM from the beginning, from the first days in, in, in the USA. And he's now in Switzerland. He visits us very often and uh, without his help, we would have been able to do all the setups and here yeah, the different funding, um, uh, the different collaborators um, in Strasbourg and also in Bordeaux who work with us. Yeah, I only showed you an incomplete list of projects. We are working on some other subjects now, but this is I just want to make it um, somehow short. Okay, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, for your interest. And uh, if you have uh, questions, please, um, I might be able to answer them. I hope so.